All right, I think that's everything we need. Now, to turn it into something. So, I have a confession. For the last, oh, year or so, I've been hoarding every single shred of wasted filament from my 3D prints. And in this video, the first of a series, we're going to try to build a practical, affordable filament recycling setup that allows anyone to turn this into this. Let's get after it. So first things first, a little bit of background. As we all know, while 3D printing has a ton of ecological and environmental benefits that I've discussed in previous videos, such as reducing the need for transportation, allowing us to fix things instead of replacing them, and much, much more, it does also generate a ton of waste. This can be something as simple as a failed print, all the way up to support structures, and even things as minuscule as purge lines. This has always just been considered part of the deal. But more recently, companies have started cropping up like Recycling Fabrique, who've proven that it can in fact be practical to recycle these failed prints into new filament that is not only usable, but also beautiful and functional. Unfortunately, it's still very early days for these types of companies. As the founder of Recycling Fabrique told me in a podcast interview, they're actually already inundated with more plastic than they can reasonably even sort, and they haven't even started accepting filament from outside of their home country of Germany. Meanwhile, I, like many of you, have been generating more plastic waste than ever before with my 3D printing. As this channel grows, I'm taking on bigger, more ambitious projects, I'm testing more unproven filaments and printers, and with the arrival of printers like the Bamboo Lab A1 Mini, I've actually started doing much more multicolor printing, which, until I can get my hands on a Prusa XL here in Israel, inevitably means lots and lots of purge and therefore waste. Now all this has me really wanting a solution to recycle my filament right here in the studio, especially since Printables recently added a section where you can actually list yourself as a recycling center and find other recycling centers, meaning that people can drop off their filled prints and someone like me will be able to recycle them into filament for future projects or just to give away to subscribers. The problem with all that is up until now, recycling filament has been either prohibitively expensive or incredibly unreliable. Most commercial solutions for shredding old 3D prints cost thousands of dollars and they don't even offer extrusion. For that, you either need a very sketchy homemade extrusion solution, which won't be very consistent, or a low-end commercial grade solution, which again, costs another thousands of dollars. And don't get me wrong, I really care about the environment, but it just doesn't make sense to spend something like $10,000 to recycle filament when you can literally buy like 500 kilos of new stuff for that same price. Which leads me to our project scope and challenges. Throughout this process, my goal is to build a complete filament recycling station, which meets all of the following requirements. First, the entire setup needs to be small enough to be able to fit in a home or small office. None of these impractical solutions that really only make sense for YouTubers or commercial companies in the space. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be a desktop setup, but rather that I want it to be at least compact enough that if one of you out there wants to replicate my setup, you could easily find space for it in your garage or basement. Second, it needs to be able to reliably and durably produce a reasonable amount of filament for my use and perhaps other people in my community. Yes, I could probably do this build for half as much if I rejiggered a paper shredder or a blender and then drilled out a 3D printer nozzle to 1.75 millimeters. But from what I've seen of other content creators who've tried that route, that would not result in reliable, consistent enough results to actually produce usable filament for years to come. And I'd probably spend most of my time babysitting and tweaking the extrusion system to get the filament to be even half printable. Third, it needs to be reproducible by the average community member, i.e. you guys in the audience. 
Now, I'm sure that some of you out there could probably laser cut your own steel and design your own entire extrusion line at home, but I can't. And the majority of my audience probably can't either. And if we want this project to have any serious impact, it needs to be something that many of you can and will want to do on your own to serve your own communities. That will inevitably mean relying on readily available and well-documented designs and or commercial products. With that said, my fourth criterion is that it needs to be reasonably affordable. Like, as affordable as possible given the other three constraints. My goal is to spend less than $1,500, and I'll be tracking my expenses for all of you throughout the build series. Now, I realize that this number is not what most people would consider affordable for their own personal use. But given our other constraints, it's still actually going to be a major challenge. What's more, I wanna point out that one of the major impetuses for doing this project now was the addition of the filament recycling directory on printables. $1,500 is a lot of money, objectively, but if you think about it in filament terms, it's only 75 spools. And I figure if people are able to get these machines working reliably enough that they can then begin accepting other people's failed prints, then it actually shouldn't be hard at all to collect 75 kilos of filament over the course of, say, two or three years, which is a reasonable time horizon for recouping an investment. Honestly, I'm not sure what you would do with the filament if you're not able to print that much. I mean, perhaps you could sell it back to its original owners at a discount or list it on your local Facebook marketplace or use it yourself for an Etsy store. Honestly, we can cross that bridge when we get to it. For now, I'll just be really, really happy if we're able to intercept some filament from the landfill and redirect it back onto a usable filament spool. And while we're at it, I think it would be really, really cool if we had some kind of big, hairy, audacious goal as a result of the ripple effect from this project. For example, to save 10 tons of filament from landfills as a result of this video build series. So with our challenge laid out, let's go ahead and get started with the first component, and that's the shredder itself. As I mentioned before, Many have tried and most have failed to repurpose things like paper shredders or commercial or consumer blenders and things like that. And from my research, if we really wanna be able to produce consistent and usable filament with a reasonable tolerance, that begins all the way at the first step, shredding. So as I embarked on this project, I scoured the web for commercially available shredders only to find that most readily available solutions were A, wildly expensive, B, hand-powered, or C, all of the above. Fortunately, I happened upon a website called Precious Plastic, which as far as I understand it, is or was kind of like a not-for-profit collective of people in the Netherlands, notably a guy named Dave Hackens, who created and uploaded all kinds of open source designs for things like shredders, injection molding machines, extruders, and much, much more. Now, their ultimate goal seems to have been to empower people to actually create small businesses around plastic recycling. I say seems to have been in the past tense because I found that the founders do seem to have moved on to other projects. A lot of their website is no longer updated with the latest release and update in about 2020, and their tutorials leave a lot to be desired. Fortunately, they did leave behind a thriving community as a legacy, including a Discord channel, as well as the Precious Plastics Bazaar, where people from all over the world are able to list machines or DIY kits for each of the different designs. And that's where we're gonna start. Now to be clear, there are 100% free and open source DXF files available online, which you can download and either cut yourself or send to any local service like Send Cut Send or just a local laser shop. But if you do that, you will still need to self source things like the drive shaft, the pulleys and the hardware. I consider doing all of this, but I honestly have no idea what it would cost to get that done locally here in Israel. And with so many people currently in reserves due to the war, I figured it was just going to be a lot easier and cheaper to import the parts. Now, I looked into services like this video sponsor, PCBWay, but it just wasn't economical to have them make only one kit. 
And they explained to me that things like this are going to be much more affordable with just the sheer quantity of steel you need to cut if you purchase from someone who is already producing it in bulk. With that in mind, I started surfing the Precious Plastic Bazaar where you'll be able to find all different kinds of suppliers from all over the world. At the time when I looked, nobody was actually willing to ship to Israel, but I did reach out privately to a few producers and I managed to convince one of them, PP Capi Spain, to update their shipping policies. They also informed me that if I purchased two kits, the shipping would only increase by 50%. So it would actually be an opportunity to recoup some of my investment, assuming I'm able to sell the other kit locally. So with all that said, I ordered two of their slightly older version 2.1 kits in regular non-stainless steel, complete with the Evolution drive shaft, and they were kind enough to do the chamfered holes for me free of charge. Altogether, those two kits came out to 700 euros shipped or $758.48. I then had to pay import duties and customs of $129.19. You may or may not have to pay these duties depending on where you are, and you should be able to get them back if you're like me because it's a business expense for what I do. But until I actually get them back, let's go ahead and keep track of all of that. Also, in case you're local here in Israel and you want to build your own filament shredder, I am currently trying to sell the second kit for 1,750 shekels or $485. So please ping me on Discord if you're interested. Assuming I'm successful in selling it, it'll bring my entire cost down for this part of the build to just $402 with customs duties or $273.48 if I'm able to get the duties reimbursed. That's really, really good and it puts us well ahead of the estimated prices for new material on the Precious Plastics website. But we aren't nearly done because up next, we need to source the materials for the frame. Of course, picking up some simple steel bars at a local hardware store would have been simple enough. But considering that this project is all about recycling things destined for the landfill and cutting costs wherever possible, I decided to take a slightly different approach. You might not realize it, but because of the current real estate boom and the fact that our government has mandated that every single apartment needs to be renovated with a bomb shelter, wonder why, the city is currently littered with what I lovingly call free hardware stores. Now these hardware stores have everything you could possibly want, from copper wires to steel bars, dowels, and even readily finished wooden planks for other projects. But most importantly for this project, with a little bit of elbow grease, I was able to pick up some pre-owned steel bars and strips with which to build my frame, all for the low, low price of free. Now, the keen-eyed and clean-handed of you may be staring in disbelief at your screens right now, thinking, hold on, is this guy seriously looting a building that's scheduled for demolition? To which I reply, no, 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 I'm not looting. I'm part of a small volunteer organization that spends their weekends reclaiming and recycling raw materials that are otherwise destined for landfills. Please, 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 hold your applause and your praise. I'm not a hero. I'm just an everyday concerned citizen. Now, while Tel Aviv's wonderful free hardware stores have so far been able to provide me with just about everything I needed to get us up to this point, Sometimes there are things that you can't find in a dumpster. Things like CNC machined parts, metal 3D prints, sheet metal fabrication, or custom made PCBs. But don't despair because all those things, and honestly much, much more, can be had both quickly and affordably thanks to this video's sponsor, PCBWay. Thanks to their incredible scale, PCBWay is able to custom fabricate honestly anything from 3D printed parts and injection molded parts all the way to custom PCBs, sheet metal fabrication, and more in quantities small or large, cheaper and with better customer service than the local suppliers here in Israel and probably where you live too. They even have a real life engineer check over every single design you upload to ensure that there won't be any issues in manufacturing. Pretty cool. We'll actually be using PCBWay for a crucial part in the next video in the series, but until then, do make sure to check them out using the link in the description, which will get you a free sign-on bonus to use on your very first order. So thanks again to PCBWay, our longest standing sponsor. All right, let's get back to work, shall we? With our shredder kit and frame procured, we now need a motor. 
Precious Plastic casually states that any old motor will do as long as it's sufficiently powerful. It doesn't really matter how it looks or how big it is or the size, we only need to make sure it's slow and powerful. As in 1.8 to 2.2 kilowatts powerful. But there are actually a number of things that you need to take into consideration. Things that I wish I'd known before. Keep in mind, I'm not an engineer and I have zero experience with industrial equipment like this. So I'm just repeating back what I've learned by consulting with more qualified people like fellow YouTuber Clow42. But if I get something wrong, please do let me know in the comments below. So first of all, industrial motors of this size can be single phase or triple phase power. And before you pick one up, you probably want to make sure that you have access to triple phase power wherever it is you want to place this. Thing. Otherwise, get another motor with single phase power. Next, you need to consider the RPM of the motor. Most of the industrial motors out there spin at a crazy fast RPM, like 1915 in the case of the one I picked up. That is way way too fast for our application. And in reality, we really want a low RPM between 30 and 70 with high torque. Now, the most obvious way to achieve this would be to gear down the motor, generally with a right angle worm gearbox, such as the one you see in the assembly video by Precious Plastic. The third thing that you need to take into consideration is the mounting style. You can generally find the same type of motor with two or even three different mounting styles. There are those that bolt on near the drive shaft, generally to the aforementioned gearbox. There are those that bolt onto the frame from the body of the motor, etc. Unfortunately, I didn't know any of this when I went searching for motors on Facebook Marketplace. And since the instructions clearly stated that it doesn't really matter how it looks or how big it is or the size, I picked up the first one that I found, which happened to be a brand new 2.2 kilowatt 90L motor for 600 shekels or $166. Now that's a steal of a deal, so I obviously jumped on it, but given my ignorance, it also happened to be three phase power, high RPM, and without the mounting brackets needed to mount the body to the frame. But this is what we've got, so we're going to need to make it work somehow. To that end, instead of trying to source a gearbox that perfectly meshes up to this motor and its mounting points, I instead consulted with Cloud42 and my local electrician turned personal friend Mohammed, who both told me that my best bet was going to be a variable frequency drive converter or VFD. As I understand it, and let's be honest, I don't, this is something like an electronic device that allows you to input electricity from the wall on one end and then outputs electricity on the other in such a way that it controls the motor speed and direction all without the need of a physical gearbox. That's pretty insane to me and I actually don't understand the actual physics of how we're going to get a motor that wants to spin at 1900 RPM and low torque to spin at 30 to 70 RPM and high torque but trust the experts, right? In any case, I ordered both the VFD and an external controller with buttons on AliExpress because stuff like this is crazy expensive in Israel for a total of $76.32. That brings our current total to 645 with duties, assuming I'm able to sell the second kit, or 516 if I get the duties reimbursed. Either way, we are still way under budget according to Precious Plastics build budget, and that makes me really, really happy. That VFD is going to take a couple of weeks to get here from China. So for now, let's get to work on the assembly of the parts that we do have. To begin, I assembled the actual shredder unit itself. Now this isn't super complicated per se, but the instructional video provided is far from comprehensive and there are different versions out there. So none of it shows exactly what goes where. Fortunately, PP Capi Spain did provide me with their own documentation and tutorial video and while it was in Spanish, I still was able to figure out and get the thing assembled. Now, admittedly, this did require taking it apart and reassembling it a couple of times to correct my mistakes, because between my rusty Spanish and just not following instructions correctly, I did have a hard time getting clear answers on which knife goes where and in what order. From there, it was time to weld the thing together. Now, please don't get intimidated if you don't know how to weld. I don't either. 
In fact, I only recently picked up my first basic DC stick welder, as I talked about in a recent video on maker tools that I wish I'd picked up sooner. Now, these welds are not complicated or delicate in any way, but they still were not easy for me as a beginner. In fact, I'm pretty sure that I still need to go back and improve some of those welds later, especially considering that the side pieces had nothing holding them in place until you successfully tacked them into place. So it was really tricky to kind of hold it and weld it at the same time. But eventually through trial and error, I did get the thing to a point where it held together. Unfortunately, the ceramic tiles that I'd been using as a workbench pay the ultimate price in the process. Not to worry, a quick trip back to the free hardware store yielded some beautiful wooden planks. The only problem with the free hardware store is the price is great. They don't offer delivery. And one side quest later, I had a nice new and slightly crooked work surface. The next thing I needed to assemble was the frame, and here I admit that I was pretty out of my depth. In order for this thing to work properly, the frame has to be strong, sturdy, level to the ground, and built in such a way that the shredder shaft aligns perfectly with the motor shaft. Now this might be easy if you have the right motor version with the mounts on the bottom, but we don't. So I had to use my seriously inferior steelworking skills to cut and weld all different kinds of pieces to make this thing work. I actually started out by modeling the entire thing up in Onshape using some readily available models from GrabCAD for both the shredder and the motor, but those models weren't 100% exactly like mine, so I eventually just decided to bite the bullet and start cutting and welding in the hopes that I could kind of figure it out as I go along. Now, in case I haven't qualified enough, Remember that I am not a skilled welder and I encourage you to let me know respectfully all the things that I'm doing wrong in the comments below. How else will I learn? In any case, as you can imagine, building the frame took me quite some time. I've been practicing by doing some small repairs and welds around the studio for a couple of weeks now, but this was actually the first thing that I've ever built from scratch using steel. For this reason, I really took my time. I measured twice, I used machinist squares and all that. It was slow going, especially because my welding technique was absolutely atrocious at the beginning and my electrodes kept sticking to the workpiece. It honestly took me literally the entire workday, but at around four o'clock, I finally had a stable, sturdy and decent looking frame to show for all my efforts. At which point I lifted the shredder on top to match it, only to realize that I had measured the wrong side and all my dimensions were wrong. This meant that I would need to cut apart every single weld that I'd done all day and basically start from scratch. Honestly, I really should have just built this thing out of two by fours and if you're following along at home, consider building yours out of wood instead. Anyways, I'm not one to be deterred, so I decided to bite yet another bullet and put in the work to redo the entire thing. At that point, however, it was almost time to go home and be with my kids, so I decided that done is better than perfect. I cut all my welds, discovering in the process how weak and crappy they actually were, and I just started hacking version two together quickly and with little regard for perfect measurements, 90 degree angles, symmetry, any of that jazz. I figured that I could always compensate for uneven legs by either shaving the plastic end caps that were already on the steel beams or 3D printing my own legs with an added millimeter here or there. Fortunately, this turned out to be a pretty okay strategy because once I did get the version two put together with the right dimensions, I realized that the cheapy fake hardwood here in my studio bows up near the walls, meaning that if the steel legs had been around the same length all around, the frame would actually lean forward. So while this thing is admittedly pretty crooked, rickety, and just all around ugly as hell, it's not going to matter all that much. Plus, I do plan to actually bolt this thing to the wall for added stability, so I'm not gonna fret about it being perfectly even or rigid, as long as the legs can hold the weight of the shredder and motor nicely, which they can. To finish off the frame, it was time to build a motor mount. And as you will once again remember, the motor that I bought on Facebook Marketplace does not have the right kind of mount for this application. 
at all. This meant that I would need to create my own mounting solution on the frame itself, which I did by simply using pieces of scrap from the 2x2 steel bars. First, I welded cuttings on the inside of the frame, and then I welded additional cuttings on top of those, which left a little horizontal play to allow me to adjust the motor left and right to meet up with the shredder. Vertically though, I actually got very, very lucky because it seems like this will perfectly bring the motor drive shaft into alignment with the shredder's shaft on the vertical axis. But we'll have to see about all of that in the next video. So I think that's a good place for us to stop for this week, but let's talk about next steps. In the following videos in the series, we're going to deal with the wiring and electronics, attaching the motor to the shredder, building some sort of hopper to feed the plastic in, creating a lower shelf on the bottom to hold bins that'll actually collect the shredded plastic, and finally, firing it up and then dialing in our shredding so that we're getting consistent and reliable actual shreddings. And then we'll tackle the next challenge, which is gonna be extruding those shreddings into actual usable filament. So if you wanna follow along on this journey, please do make sure to subscribe and consider clicking the bell icon so you don't miss out on future videos because I'll not only be documenting my progress, but I also really wanna share what I learned along the way so that hopefully some of you can build a similar setup at home. And once it's all done, I'll be sure to not only share the final cost breakdown, but also keep you updated on how successful I've been in recuperating my investment by churning out usable filament for myself or for the local community here. It's guaranteed to be a fun and informative ride, so I hope you'll come along for it. Before I do let all of you go, let me take a quick moment to thank our YouTube members and Patreon supporters, particularly our Nylon and Peak members, Chip Cox, Two Crazy Ketos, Amir Khen, Chris Miller, and Don Arledge. You guys rock. And if you too want to see or hear your name at the end of my videos, plus get exclusive benefits and behind the scenes content on this project and any other that I do, then make sure to check out the links in the description for our Patreon, or just click that join button below to become a YouTube member. All right, that's all for this week. I got to get to work here on the rest of the shredder, but I'll see all of you on the next layer.